Assalamu alaikum and good morning everyone. It's our great pleasure to have you all in today's fourth international seminar on importance of diplomacy in conflict resolution, the current war between Russia and Ukraine, which is organized by the Center for Peace Studies of South Asian Institute of Policy and Governance, North South University, Dhaka, Bangladesh. I am Abdul Ohab, coordinator of CPS. Would like to warmly welcome to this seminar, the chair of the session, Professor Chancellor of North South University, distinguished panelists joining online and offline from Germany, Norway, India, Turkey, Russia, and Bangladesh. Representatives from different embassy, journalists, respected deans of different schools, and chair of different departments, my fellow colleagues, and my dear students. Let me briefly introduce you with the SIPC and CPS. The South Asian Institute of Policy and Governance, SIPC of North South University, is the only and one pioneering institute with a regional focus on policy and governance in Bangladesh. SIPC is regularly conducting research, holding dialogues on different issues, and imparting training and education on public policy and governance. The Institute is currently running training on negotiation skills for the government officials of Bangladesh and people in private enterprise on the areas of climate change and development finance. The Institute has a two years long thesis based graduate program called Masters in Public Policy and Governance MPPG for the civil servants of South Asia. Students are mostly coming from Bangladesh, Nepal, Bhutan, and Sri Lanka. It also offers an executive master's in policy and governance EMPG program. SIPG has an interdisciplinary center, which is called the Center for Peace Studies, CPS, which aims to facilitate the academic study of peace building and the promotion of a resilient society through a business-based and empirical research at North South University. The center aspires to be a hub of academic research and activity in the areas of conflict studies and peace promotion that will have national, regional, and global implications. CPS is a platform for academics, researchers, and practitioners from diverse academic backgrounds working together to create a peaceful world with a focus on sustainable, inclusive solutions for contemporary humanitarian crises. CPS members are engaged with different research works related to peace and conflict, and also organize different seminars and webinars with a vast range of peace and conflict related topics, including Afghan crisis, remembering Rohingya genocide, Israel atrocities against Palestine, Sri Lankan crisis, Myanmar crisis, and Russia and Ukraine war. Apart from its ongoing research and advocacy programs, the Center for Peace Studies this year has already organized three seminars on the Russia and Ukraine war. And today, we're having the fourth seminar on this series. I hope you will enrich your understanding on different factors that has played a crucial role in this world. I know we all are eagerly waiting for the panelists. Therefore, without further delay, I would like to request the moderator of this program, Professor Tofik M. Hawk, to take over the moderating role. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you, Dr. Oham. Uh, salam and good morning, everyone. It is a great to have you all in today's fourth CPS International Seminar on the topic of Russia, Ukraine war. The seminar title, Importance of Diplomacy in Conflict Resolution in the Context of Current War Between Russia and Ukraine is organized by CPS of North South University. I'm Professor Tofik Hawk, Director of the South Asian Institute of Policy and Governance and Center for Peace Studies. Welcome you all uh, to this seminar. Uh, let us uh, talk a little bit about the objective of the seminar, that why did we organize this one uh, with a very distinguished panelist. 
we have two major objectives for today's discussion. The first one is to let our students and faculty members get diverse perspectives of narrative of the war and diplomacy. We invited different parties involved in the war and diplomacy, as well as academic experts. The Center for Peace Studies also invited, I just want to let you know this uh, information that we also invited the European Union ambassador to Bangladesh to join this seminar. For some reasons, his participation could not be ensured. The second objective is to let our students and faculty members get the opportunity to interact with a panel of discussants who have the extensive knowledge on war, peace, and diplomacy. So this will be an absolutely academic exercise and uh, we want to do it and uh, see it from the purely academic point of view. So let me a little bit talk to you about the three, the series of the seminars that we have organized. And this is the fourth one, as Dr. Wahab already mentioned, that uh, what did we get there? Because we do organize seminars, webinars, or any kind of the, this kind of dialogues and discussion uh, to also develop policy briefs or working papers. So our first seminar uh, on the issue was Russia-Ukraine war, who gains, who losses, was organized on 8th March uh, in the same venue where we are now sitting. And the panelists in that uh, seminar basically discussed the legal, ethical, moral perspective of the war. Europe's uh, current refugee crisis and humanitarian aspects, the war's impact on Bangladesh, South Asia, and role of the UN were also discussed. The panelists opined that the world will change due to this war, and all should be aware of the fallouts of this one. On 1st April 2022, uh, we organized another international webinar with the participation of two Nobel laureates, uh, Jody Williams, who got her Nobel in Peace, and also Richard J. J. Roberts. And they spoke about uh, the title of the uh, webinar was, Is War Inevitable? And Can We Change the Paradigm? And this was jointly organized by CPS and uh, Daily Potomalo, a leading uh, uh, newspaper uh, in Bangladesh. This Nobel laureate focused on the human rights violations and warned that the whole world will be in jeopardy in the near future as it may lead to nuclear war. So the whole global community should strive to stop wars, especially the future nuclear wars. The panelists were also concerned that large countries may yet get, get away with invading their small neighboring countries and criticize the ineffectiveness of the United Nations as it cannot bring nations together to stop the war anymore. Then on 12th May, 2022, the third CPS webinar, international webinar uh, titled Russia's uh, uh, invasion in the Ukraine, the potential for diplomacy in times of war was held. And it was jointly organized by CPS and the Peace Research Institute, Frankfurt, Germany. The panelists of this uh, webinar stated that sanctions have been a key tool used by Western states to increase pressure on Russia since the war began. But there is some questions about the effectiveness of the sanctions. Panelists observed uh, that this war will not bring victory to any warring sides, and this war should end through diplomatic negotiation. In continuation of the observations of the third webinar, we, then we plan for this fourth one, uh, which is uh, now, uh, we are having. And we are seeing that CPS believe that it has been more than three months and still the full blown war is raging on causes and causing unfavorable humanitarian losses. The war has already triggered a global supply chain fallout and inflation dragging the world in the brink of another economic recession and acute food crisis that may result in a famine probably in global south. Moreover, the possibilities of a larger nuclear war cannot be ruled out. If the war lingers, then it is the general people who will suffer around the world. And we are seeing it even in living in Bangladesh, a small uh, farmer or a rickshaw ola when going to the shop, he is also feeling the heat of the war because inflation is rising very, very uh, sharply. In this context, it is an urgent call from the peace-loving people around the world to immediately put a full stop to this war. And from the recent trends, it is understood that negotiation and diplomatic solutions can only resolve this conflict. Both sides need to sit on a mediating table and come to a mutual understanding to end this war. In the light of this motive, the, our seminar intends to discuss the importance of diplomacy in conflict resolution. So we have a very distinguished 
uh, panelists today, and we are really grateful who have joined online with us from Germany, Norway, and from uh, New Delhi, and also to ambassadors who joined us physically. So I'm just uh, 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 letting you know the names at this point of the time. I'll give a brief introduction while I will be giving the floor to them. So we have with us Professor Dr. Nicole uh, Petyokov, uh, Professor of International Relations and Theories of Global Order, uh, Peace Research Institute Frankfurt, Germany. We have Professor Garnhild Hugensen Yorov, uh, Professor in Security Studies, the Arctic University of Norway. We have Ambassador Shohidul Haq, Professorial Fellow, SIPG and ISU, and former Foreign Secretary of Government of Bangladesh. These three of uh, our panelists join online. And then we have with us His Excellency Mustafa Uman Turan, Ambassador of Turkey to Bangladesh. His Excellency also we have His Excellency Alexander Vikentievich Mentiski, Ambassador uh, of Russian Federation to the People's Republic of Bangladesh. I'm, I'm uh, apologizing, apologizing if I could not pronounce the names properly. And then we have with us Pro Vice Chancellor of North South University, Professor Ismail Hossein, who is chairing the session today. Uh, let me uh, tell a little bit about the modality. So what we have planned that initially we will listen from five panelists in the first round of the uh, discussion. And I will let you know that uh, how many minutes uh, have been allocated for your speech. And after the first round of the speech by the panelists, uh, we'll open the floor and we will uh, take questions and uh, probably written questions from our students or any specific comments uh, also, if uh, there are, or also from our faculty members. And we have kept uh, 20 to 30 minutes time for open discussion. And at the end, we will summarize and our chair of the session will give his uh, uh, speech. So with that note, uh, I would now like to request our first panelist, Professor Dr. Nicole uh, of Peace Research Institute of Frankfurt to give her a speech. Uh, Professor Nicole, uh, you'll get seven minutes time at this point of uh, our session. Thank you. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you so much. And also a warm a good morning from uh, Frankfurt, very early here. Um, I'm very happy that CPS has organized this very important event at this time. And thank you also very much to having me in this round of so distinguished speakers this morning. Now, without further ado, let me start on my few notes on our topic. Now, uh, some people think that war can only be ended by the defeat of one party by the others, while others hold that wars end, end only through negotiated settlements. And in fact, actually, wars have many different endings, ranging from defeat to exhaustion of both parties or several parties to settlements. And in all of these endings, diplomacy has, of course, a role to play. But its core mission usually is to stop the fighting so that the talking can begin or can at least prosper, that is, have an effect. That does not have to mean, and it seldomly has in the past, that diplomacy stops when war begins. Diplomacy is always taking place alongside and in the midst of war. And of course, we can see this in Russia's war in Ukraine as well. When Emmanuel Macron or Olaf Scholz continuously talk to Putin on the phone to call for a ceasefire, for instance. When Recep Tayyip Erdogan hosts talk between the warring sides on Turkish soil, or when UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres visits Moscow. Diplomacy is at work, even if it is not necessarily working out as we've seen. We could also observe it in the talks between the two sides in the borderlands of Belarus or on video that took place also for quite some time during these conflicts, even though these regular talks have stopped lately. Now, regarding the interaction between the warring parties directly, diplomacy's job is the harder, the less the parties think they need diplomacy. The more the warring parties believe that they can determine the war in theater that is on the battlefield, the less interest they have in a settlement, asking them necessarily for concessions to make. Now, this is exactly the situations we are observing in Russia's war in Ukraine. At least one of the two parties still thinks, or I think it is more accurate to say, 
begins to think again that it can decide this war in battlefield. This is visible on the Russian side that shows hardly any serious interest in negotiations and that didn't really react to Ukrainian offers that it demanded before, like offering neutrality of Ukraine, for instance. But instead, it made moves that destroyed trust in its stance, at least for the Ukrainian side, like the claim to withdraw from the Kiev region to create trust um, with the Ukrainians, while only using this as a strategy to regroup forces to start a new offensive in the east and south of Ukraine. Or think about the documented war crimes in Busha, in Mykolaiv, and so many other cities and communities under Russian military occupancy. These are, of course, um, incidents that destroy trust that is so important for diplomacy to work out. Now, as long as one party thinks it can get its will by force, so long we will not observe a settlement. Of course, you have to remember that a dictate is not a settlement. A settlement in which both parties are willing to make concessions is not thinkable as long as one of the two sides think it can get its will by force. And this is why so many states, European states, NATO members, but also to be on these two groups, have issued sanctions against the Russian federations and have decided to grant Ukrainian defense forces military assistance. The rationale is to increase the cost of this war for Russia to such a degree that it develops a genuine interest in a settlement with Ukraine. Now, don't get me wrong. This is not the sole or even the primary reason for sanctions. The first and initial reason is, of course, Russia's breach of international law by waging a war of aggression against one of its neighbors. But sanctions are not, and contrary to what many people think, simply a tool for punishing misbehavior, but they are always designed to change future behavior by altering the costs and benefits of different kinds of actions. We are obviously not at a point where the cost-benefit balance tilts towards settlements, but sanctions are no short-term measures. They are working for the marathon, not the sprint. And this is why we will probably see sanctions against the Russian Federation in place for a long period of time. Now, diplomacy in war is not limited to the interaction between the two warring parties, of course. This is already clear from the many attempts that I already alluded to by third parties to offer mediation between the two. But it also matters in interaction between the rest, that is all those countries that are no direct parties to the conflict. Russia's war in Ukraine affects not only Russia and Ukraine, although in particular Ukraine is paying the highest price for this aggression in the short run, but it also affects many other countries and regions. The war has hampered the grain harvest as it has stopped its export to other countries. With Russia and Ukraine belonging to the most important producers and exporters, uh, this directly affects countries in the Middle East, in Africa, and in so many other regions where wheat prices are already skyrocketing. But make no mistake, this is not an effect of the sanctions, as it is often claimed. Sanctions do not address the trade of grain or other foodstuff. It is the bombs that prevent farmers to plant the new seed and to harvest the wheat. And it is the mining and blocking of water passages that prevent it to be shipped to third countries. It is the war and those who wage it. The war has also caused another refugee crisis with millions on the run in Ukraine or having to leave the country to other states. It has spurred inflation in many states and it has hampered many industries. Here, diplomacy has two main functions. Help finding ways to mitigate the negative effect of this war on vulnerable societies. Setting up food programs, redirecting agricultural plants and exports, etc. And by organizing multilateral responses and offering forums for diplomacy to gain a hold again, also between the two conflicting parties. That is by consulting each other by spreading information that is, that is reliable and by developing new initiatives for peace settlements as long as the two parties are not ready to do this on their own. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, uh, Professor Nicole. I'm, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry that I could not uh, introduce her before giving her the uh, floor. Mm -hmm. Professor Nicole is the director of Peace Research Institute of Frankfurt and holds a chair for international relations and theories of global order at Gothen University in Frankfurt. Her research focuses on conflicts around international institutions and norms and forms of political rule and its legitimation beyond the nation state. I can see lots of our students have joined and uh, their interest is overwhelming. I would uh, just request that uh, we don't have enough chair, but we'll be very happy that 
if you can just stand for some time and uh, probably you can arrange some more chairs uh, in between. So I now would like to request our uh, next panelist, Professor uh, Gunhil, uh, who is a board member, uh, uh, who is a, uh, is a professor in security studies in the Arctic University of Norway. She is a leader of the Grey Zone Research Group and research professor of Peace Research Institute of Oslo, PRIO. She is a board member of Norwegian Institute of International Affairs. So, Professor Gunhild, uh, seven minutes for you at this point of the discussion. Uh, hello, um, thank you very much for uh, inviting me for this uh, very important discussion. And uh, I think uh, Professor Detelhoff has given us a really, really good overview. So it's kind of hard for me to figure out, you know, well, what am I going to add to this? So uh, I will um, I'll do my, my best on the basis of the title that we were given about the importance of diplomacy in, in conflict resolution. And as Professor Detelhoff has already mentioned, uh, diplomacy has been taking place uh, both prior to the actual outbreak of this part of the war, because of course, this war did not just start on the 24th of January 2022 but uh, started already in 2014 and slightly prior to, but the, the, the first major intervention took place in the annexation of Crimea in 2014. So Ukrainians have been dealing with this conflict for eight years. Uh, and what was interesting was that there were a lot of diplomatic efforts in the lead up to the events that took place now in February, 2022. And uh, many, many commentators prior to the 24th of February did not think that Russia would invade, uh, felt that perhaps um, the, what was happening diplomatically and the posturing that was taking place prior to the actual invasion was more or less pressure tactics to either get uh, more control over the overall Donbass region or Luhansk and Donetsk uh, territories uh, by, by Russia and to solidify their claim to, to Crimea. Uh, and, and it is interesting as much as, uh, I don't know, some political scientists uh, would like to say they can predict what's happening in the future. The vast majority of us cannot. And this was an, another, another excellent example of exactly that. Um, and, and so now we're trying to, to figure out, you know, how, how will this um, war progress? And even there, we have not really been... Um, uh, so good at predicting. There were many who were predicting if the war did break out, that this would be very, very short, that the Russian military might would quickly overwhelm any Ukrainian defense and that this could just last a few days. That also has not happened. So we're, we're looking at uh, a conflict taking place that is actually defying a lot of expectations on, on a number of fronts. The first was that Russia actually decided to do this intervention, and the second, um, at the very least, that, that Ukraine has been able to hold out for, um, for so long. And, and it does raise the, the question about the efficacy about diplomacy, um, not that diplomacy what does not happen and should not happen at these various stages of a rather unpredictable conflict, but to what degree, degree there's room for different levels of, uh, of diplomacy. Um, basically, you would think that there's a need for a certain amount of compromise, and that has been mentioned a number of times, uh, particularly in the beginning, thinking that Ukraine may have to cede parts of their territory to Russia. That way, Russia can move away uh, with their face uh, intact or whatever, or not lose face, um, and, and that this would uh, then calm the conflict and at least uh, cease hostilities. Um, Ukraine, however, has been rather emboldened by their initial successes. And these successes, even though the losses on the Ukrainian side are um, being revealed to being quite high, 
Uh, nevertheless, the, the morale, the fighting morale, you could say, within Ukraine is still quite significant. So the interest to compromise is not necessarily there on the Ukrainian side. And then on the Russian side, for having started this, uh, this phase of the war in the 24th of February, um, it would be highly problematic for Russia to say, well, no, actually, we're, we're not going to be doing this uh, anymore. And that's where the losing face is. And also gets us around to the point, like, why is this war taking place anyway? What is the rationale behind this? This is also a point of discussion and not a full agreement on as well, uh, because we've received a variety of justifications for why Russia has, has pushed farther um, this year uh, in, into Ukraine, ranging from a continued presence of a threat by NATO uh, along Russia's uh, European borders, which actually is a very small part of Russia, needless to say, but nevertheless, um, that's a very powerful small border um, with, with Russia on that side. So there's been the discussion about the, um, the threat that NATO expansion since the 1990s has, um, has imposed on Russia. There's been very mixed messaging as to whether or not this has been construed as a threat by Russia this entire time, or whether it has been increasingly articulated as a threat. So there's a particular narrative here, which has been dynamic, which has been changing. There's also the narrative of the role of Ukraine to Russia and whether or not Ukraine is in fact an independent state. And the president of Russia, President Putin has indicated that uh, a number of times that he's actually never really thought of Ukraine as being independent. So this is a natural part in a sense of the, the Russian state. And therefore that also justifies the, the incursion. And then there may be various sort of smaller reasons um, in between included, well, smaller reasons. Uh, there's also the claimed um, sense of uh, the Russian minorities within Ukraine being um, uh, oppressed by Ukrainians and therefore Russia is supporting Russians in Ukraine in a sense of a liberation force or a freedom force. So there, there are those narratives too. So there's multiple narratives actually backing up and I'm only mentioning a couple of them that is backing up this, uh, this particular intervention. So the room for compromise at the moment, given these narratives and a lack of clarity over what what actually is the rationale of, of Russia um, going in? Because at the end of the day, it is Russia who made that move on the 24th of, uh, of February. Um, there's a lack of uh, interest for compromise at the moment on, on both these sides, in part because the Russian military might has not overwhelmed the Ukrainian forces or the Ukrainian people. And that's another thing that's important to keep in mind that when we're talking about Ukraine defending itself, fighting back, or as a state of Ukraine, it's not just the state and state forces, but it's, uh, there's been a lot of willingness on the part of the people and the people of Ukraine who have uh, been resisting uh, the intervention by, by Russia. So, the willingness to compromise does not seem to be present on either on either side. So it'll be very interesting to see what diplomacy can do, whether international organizations have uh, any more prominent role to play. Um, as uh, Professor Detelhoff has also mentioned, um, the UN has also been criticized for not a, an overwhelming presence in this particular war. It has been relegated, interestingly, also as a European war and let, let the Europeans figure this out. So that's, uh, it, which is an interesting um, narrative in and of itself and, and says something maybe about the way we treat conflict as regional problems and try to keep them as such, whereas the rest of the world may do uh, la 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 la, um, to put it in a rather a blunt tone. Um, so, so what are the role of international organizations when we have these sorts of conflicts? Should these things really be, just be dealt with regionally? Is there a role for international organizations to, uh, to play? And um, at the moment, uh, it, 
Rosetta, these, I think these are all sort of interesting questions um, to, to follow up on. So I hope we can discuss them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Gunil. I think uh, very interesting uh, points of discussions are coming. And uh, as you were discussing that interest to compromise is not there probably in both sides till now. And also you mentioned about the narratives of the war, uh, different narratives coming from uh, different parts and, and in, especially in the global South, that's why uh, we are also so confused uh, because of that so many narratives are coming. And uh, then the question also uh, comes there that as Professor Nicole was raising that uh, whether we are going to see the, uh, the it can be settled only in the battlefield. If that is the situation, what is the future of diplomacy? So there comes the talk about mediation and diplomacy and our next panelist basically, we invited him because uh, Turkey is playing, Turkey uh, is playing a very important role uh, with many other countries they are also doing and they have try, tried, but till now uh, the role of Turkey is basically very significant in terms of mediation. So I now at this point of the time, would like to request uh, His Excellency Mustafa Osman Turan. Uh, he is he joined Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Turkey in 1992, following his studies in international relations at the Middle East Technical University in Ankara. As a career diplomat, he worked in uh, Italy, Albania, Macedonia, Kosovo, Austria, Afghanistan, and Belgium. Before being appointed as uh, Turkish ambassador to Bangladesh, he was based in Ankara as Deputy Director General for Multi lateral economic affairs. So over to you, sir, so I get 10 minutes. Yeah, it's up to you, you can come here also. Thank you very much, uh, Pro Vice Chancellor, uh, faculty members, uh, dear students, um, before I start, um, I'd like to uh, underline the information that was given uh, just now uh, about why I was invited here. Uh, I'm invited probably because uh, I represent a country, uh, Turkey, as we call it now, uh, located in a geography affected by active, frozen and potential conflicts. Therefore, uh, my country plays a pioneering role at the global level in raising awareness and creating capacity for mediation. Uh, mediation is, as you know, a method of peaceful resolution of conflicts uh, to achieve sustained peace, stability, and prosperity, especially in our neighborhood uh, and beyond. Uh, my country carries out this role with a multi-layered and diverse architecture of initiatives, including mediation efforts in the field, uh, as well as co-chairmanship of groups of friends at the UN, the OSCE, Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, where I served for four years in Vienna, and also the OIC, Organization of uh, Islamic countries. Uh, we are hosting international mediation conferences and the Mediation for Peace Certificate Program. So I have a few things to share today with you um, with this background. So at the outset, allow me to thank the Center for Peace Studies uh, of the North-South University for taking this initiative to provide an opportunity to have a discussion on the current war between Russia and Ukraine. It is not only urgent, but also crucial to have these uh, debates and dialogue to end this war, save lives and restore international law and order based on just and durable solutions to be found not on the battlegrounds, but at the negotiation tables through diplomacy, which is the topic of our discussion today. On the 100th day of the war in Ukraine, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres said, and I quote, the conflict has already taken thousands of lives 
caused untold destruction, displaced millions of people, resulted in unacceptable violations of human rights, and it's inflaming a three-dimensional global crisis, food, energy, and finance, that is pummeling the most vulnerable people, countries, and economies, end of quote. Our position is clear and firm. We support sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine. Russia's military attack against Ukraine uh, is an unjustified, illegal, and illegitimate act of aggression against a founding member of the United Nations. It is a blatant violation of the UN Charter. Therefore, this war has to end. This unlawful war has already caused a humanitarian crisis that Europe has not seen since the end of the Second World War. Since the outbreak of the war, we have been relentlessly working on two tracks of diplomacy. The, the first of which is actively supporting the efforts to ease the humanitarian situation. We're working on the establishment of the humanitarian contact group together with the United Nations. We are also providing Ukraine and neighboring countries with humanitarian aid since the beginning of the crisis. So far, 97 truckloads of humanitarian assistance were delivered to Ukraine and Moldova. A team of AFAD, our emergency relief organization, is stationed at the Siret border gate at the Ukrainian-Romanian border in order to assess the humanitarian needs in Ukraine and to coordinate the ongoing aid operations. The second track where we play a significant role is facilitating the efforts for a negotiated settlement, settlement the topic of our discussion today. We engage both sides of the conflict diplomatically with a view to bringing an end to the hostilities. Having a strategic partnership with Ukraine and a working relationship with Russia in various regions of the world makes Turkey's position unique. We initially brought together the foreign ministers of Russia and Ukraine in Antalya in early March, which was the first political contact between the two countries after the outbreak of the war. In addition to regular dialogue with President Zelensky, President Erdogan stayed in touch with President Putin to impress upon him the importance of diplomacy to stop the mounting humanitarian damage of the conflict. Our president's personal engagement and his good rapport with both leaders helped negotiations gain traction. Ukrainian and Russian delegations met for the fourth round of face-to-face -face technical talks in Istanbul on March 29th. This was the first of its kind outside Belarus. At the end of those negotiations in Istanbul, representatives of both countries reported the most meaningful progress since the start of the crisis. Unfortunately, atrocities in Bucha, Irpin, and Maripol have complicated the diplomatic process. The momentum has been lost, but the talks have not fully collapsed. We cannot give up on the hope of peace. Diplomatic channels need to remain open and keeping the dialogue alive is necessary to save lives and prevent further destruction. A protracted war should not be an alternative to a negotiated solution, since it will bring more bloodshed and more destruction. It will also have negative impacts in a wider region, and none of us will be immune to those. Although both sides are now focused on military gains, we remain convinced that this conflict will ultimately end at the negotiating table. 
respect to territorial integrity and upholding the basic principles of international law must be at the core of all our diplomatic efforts. Ukraine must remain a sovereign and independent member of the international community. And it must keep all its territory. Any peace deal must ensure these fundamental principles. So what we want for Ukraine is not peace at any cost, but a just peace. This objective has been the driving force behind Turkey's actions in the aftermath of the war. It is not easy, but we'll continue our efforts for a lasting ceasefire and the comprehensive solutions. The war in Ukraine is likely to lead to the disruption of global agricultural supply chains too, further driving food prices. 45 African countries import at least a third of their wheat from Ukraine or Russia. 18 of those import more than half. If the war drags on, many countries can face immediate food shortages and we will all be affected by the rising food prices. And that's why we are discussing now with World Food Programme and OCHA on how to move forward on the passage of ships carrying grain out of Ukraine. We also expect Foreign Minister Lavrov to visit Turkey very soon to discuss this and other dimensions of the conflict. Distinguished guests, dear students and faculty. Ongoing armed conflicts are a major cause of the current crisis of famine. Global food insecurity in turn is planting the seeds of destabilization and unrest across the globe. We need to find ways to break this vicious cycle. First, we need to pursue all possible avenues of diplomacy to prevent and end armed conflicts. Our trademark role as Turkey in mediation for peace aims to do just that. Second, we need to respond to the humanitarian needs, including effective measures to combat conflict-driven food insecurity. This requires respect for humanitarian law and unhindered humanitarian assistance. We will continue to back inclusive multilateral efforts in finding solutions to the worsening crisis. Minister, Foreign Minister Çavuşoğlu announced a package of measures in support of the global food security call to action. My country, Turkey, will continue to work strengthening peace, responding to humanitarian needs, and eradicating food security. Thank you for your invitation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, His Excellency Mustafa Osman. Raised very uh, some of the important issues from the Turkey's perspective, especially the issue of sovereignty and territorial integrity. And he also mentioned that we cannot lose the hope of the peace. And basically the humanitarian issues as uh, we are seeing that Global South is going to probably uh, face a famine-like situation if the war continues. And he also discussed about the respect for international law and uh, probably the Turkey's, uh, Turkey's position that Turkey not only wants peace, but also a just peace. So now at this point of the time, I would now like to request um, uh, His Excellency uh, Alexander Fikentevich uh, uh, His Excellency Alexander Vikendilvich has graduated from the Moscow State Institute of International Relations of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the USSR in 1984. He has his diplomatic career since 1984. From 2014 to 2020, he has worked as the ambassador of the Russian Federation to Afghanistan. On May 19, 2021, he has been appointed as the ambassador uh, of the Russian Federation to People's Republic of Bangladesh. So, sir, I would like to now uh, request you to give your speech. Over to you. Thank you very much, dear, friend, uh, dear friends. 
dear colleagues, students, ladies and gentlemen. I am grateful uh, to organizers of this seminar for the opportunity to exchange views on the current situation around Ukraine. In the first place, let me uh, be clear about the, the terms. In order to call a conflict a war, one of the conflicting parties must declare war. However, neither Russia nor Ukraine has done so. Therefore, there is no legal ground to use this word. Unfortunately, to some, it seems just a techni technicality. In my remarks, I will refer to this conflict as the special military op operation as pronounced by the Russian president, Vladimir Putin. The special military operation announced on February 24th of this year was a timely and necessary decision taken when hostile military infrastructure drew near to the Russian borders. When Ukraine became thick with hundreds of foreign military advisors, when NATO members started pumping our neighbor country with cutting edge weaponry. Of course, uh, this didn't happen overnight. There, rather, there was a long process when Russia had been uh, reaching to its Western partners, voicing its uh, legitimate security concern over the deteriorating situation in uh, regional security. Let us take a look, quick look at the developments in the retrospect. It seems that uh, distinguished panelists have forgotten that uh, in February 2015, Resolution 2202 of the UN Security Council unanimously endorsed the Minsk agreements that required the Kyiv regime to start a direct dialogue with Donetsk and Lugansk, implement the age upon provision to grant special status to these regions in eastern Ukraine and to reflect this in the constitution of Ukraine. Kyiv was supposed to hold an agreement with Donetsk and Lugansk elections, provide amnesty, disengagement on the sides, a ceasefire and the withdrawal of heavy weapons. However, it never happened. We have for years knocked on various doors in Europe and the United States, urging our Western colleagues to make Ukraine fulfill its commitments. But the West was deaf to it as it was due to the fact that Ukraine publicly refused to implement the UN Security Council resolution, which endorsed the Minsk agreements signed by France and Germany. This refusal was the decisive factor behind the current situation. Encouragement of neo-Nazi theories and practices legalized by new Ukraine laws was another unacceptable step by the Kiev regime. Eventually, we had no other choice than to recognize the republics of Donetsk and Lugansk a rally to the defense of Donbass. Russian culture, language, and media that were banned in Ukraine in the past few years. Now let us uh, take a broader look at regional security. In 1997, saw the founding act between Russia and NATO, which clearly stated that we are not advisories and none of us will strengthen our own security at the expense of security of others. Equal and indivisible security was proclaimed as the goal and the underlying principle of our work. The same principle of indivisible security was enshrined in a broader context for all countries in the Euro-Atlantic region at the OSCE summits. A specific formula was set out there. Security must be equal and divisible. Each country has the right to choose alliances, but no country has the right to strengthen its security at the expense of the security of others. At the same time, it was stated that not a single organization in Euro Atlantic should be entitled to claim dominance in security matters throughout the vast geopolitical space. Regrettably, US-led NATO colleagues have grossly violated the obligation not to strengthen their security at the expense of others. It resulted in unrestrained NATO expansion to the East. We have been warning all these long years that this will not end well, 
and that threats are being created to our security, despite the numerous promises and commitments made by the West. In 2009, we proposed concluding a European security treaty, which legally, with a legally binding obligation. We received a polite and condescending answer to the effect this, this would not work because the West is prepared to provide legal security guarantees only to NATO countries. In November two, uh, uh, 2021, we came up with another proposal. President of the Russian Federation, Vladimir Putin, proposed concluding a Russia-USA and Russia-NATO treaties. It would affirm security guarantees for all countries of the region, including Ukraine and other states that are not members of any military political bloc. Blocks will not be expanded. The participants will outline reliable guarantees that will not create a feeling of danger or threats to anyone. This was arrogantly shut down as well. This is the brief account of our relentless and earnest diplomatic efforts, efforts aimed at budding a durable and acceptable to all solution to the regional security issues. Unfortunately, they found no appropriate and meaningful reaction from the, our Western partners. Their refusal to discuss sensitive aspects of Russian national security and inability to make Ukraine abide by its international commitments made the special military operation inevitable. Today, we find ourselves in the midst of the gravest crisis of the modern times, which has repercussions for the entire world. And yet there is still no place for true diplomacy as Western countries keep pumping Ukraine with razor edge weapons, their diplomats vehemently demand Russian defeat in the battlefield, calling upon Ukraine to fight till the last Ukraine. Joseph Borrell is particularly notorious for this aggressive rhetoric and warmongering and becoming for the head of European diplomacy. As far as, as uh, contacts uh, with the Ukraine side are concerned, we have never refused to talk. As evidenced from uh, the meetings in Belarus, Belarus and Turkey, as well as negotiation through video conference. However, for this means to be fruitful, it requires a constructive position from Kiev, which presently is nowhere in sight. Moreover, the QN patrons in Europe and the USA seem to buy Kiev from having any substantive interaction with Moscow, which makes all the efforts futile. For Moscow, diplomacy has always been the first choice. Our doors remain open for all faithful efforts, but it needs more than one party to negotiate, as rightly was mentioned by Dr. Nicole Deitfelhoff. Requires an ability to conduct, uh, conduct a respectful dialogue, to be open-minded and responsive, responsive towards aspiration and sensitiveness of the other sides. As of now, there is these prerequisites are absent. Just the last example, just recently, a few days ago, NATO countries, it means uh, Bulgaria, Montenegro, and Northern uh, Macedonia, they refused uh, to give the permission to the plan of our foreign minister, Lavrov, to, uh, to fly to Serbia. What kind of diplomacy it is? Thank you. Just a uh, few remarks if I have uh, the time, because uh, so much was talked about uh, food crisis. Let me uh, reply on this uh, question. Uh, two years back, the UN warned about the risk of global food crisis. It was the growth of aggressive food prices over the recent years is being driven by the fallout from the COVID-19 pandemic the short-sighted economic energy policies by major Western countries, trade wars, unfavorable weather conditions, the illegal unilateral restrictions imposed by the West against Russia, as well as the underfunding of the agricultural sector. According to the data, UNCTAD data, 
there appears to be no global physical shortage of food. The issue is in its distribution structure. The price factor also plays a role. The agri uh, food prices were recorded, uh, the spike of in agri food prices were recorded already in 2020. Then a COVID-19 pandemic resulting in severe disruption of global supply, production and logistic chains. A surge of financial injections into EU, US and Japanese economy to boost post-pandemic recovery caused a significant increase in demand and consequently soaring inflation. The EU, EU ill-advised headlong green energy transaction led to record energy prices. This in turn triggered a rise in agricultural production costs, fuel electricity prices rose substantially. This immediately reflected in fertilizer prices and cereal production. Then unfavorable uh, conditions, weather conditions, and natural disaster, disaster in some parts of the world. Take, for example, uh, the ban which was introduced by uh, India just recently. The EU and the United States openly declared an, on all out economic trade war against our country in full oblivion to Russian stating as a key global supplier of basic agricultural products. Now, so much talk is about that Russia do not allow uh, Ukraine grain to, uh, to be exported uh, in foreign countries. It's not true. If uh, you will read uh, the comments of our officials, you will see that uh, now 70 uh, ships cannot move uh, from Odessa or from uh, the ports of Ukraine but because of the uh, mind. Just uh, my uh, colleague uh, mentioned the visit of uh, Mr. Lavrov. It seems that the discussion is going between Ukraine, Russia, and uh, United Nations, as well as uh, uh, Turkey. The point uh, will be that soon it will be declared. It seems that uh, uh, Turkey will be allowed uh, to enter at their support to demine it and uh, to uh, um, to carry the ships, not to carry, but uh, uh, they will move, uh, move, uh, move the, to a certain point where Russian uh, ships, uh, military ships, will uh, go with them to uh, Turkey soil. I would like to mention that uh, every day, every day, we declare Russia uh, humanitarian maritime corridors from eight o'clock in the morning till 19 uh, p.m. Moscow time in the Sea of Azov and also in Black Sea. But uh, unfortunately, Ukraine side doesn't allow to do it. So just a few, uh, you know, this a few words about uh, this uh, crisis and regarding uh, the crisis, energy crisis, you, sh you should some, uh, uh, understand that uh, it was a policy which uh, uh, was started by uh, EU because they started uh, declared that uh, they, uh, in uh, future better uh, no oil no gas will be su supplied that it will be a green uh, blue uh, economy uh, they have started um, our policy is and was that uh, okay we should have a long term uh, contracts to supply gas and oil. Unfortunately, they decided, uh, let's, we will go for uh, spot prices. Last year, the spot uh, prices were more than uh, $1,000 uh, uh, per 1,000 uh, uh, cubic uh, meters. It was when we supplied to our long-standing mm -hmm. partners for this uh, gas for uh, $400. You can see that uh, the price was almost uh, two uh, to four uh, times higher. This is uh, their policy. Okay. Sorry to, uh, to, uh, to speak so long. Uh, I, I, it seems uh, that uh, I decided uh, to talk about this because so questions were uh, made by panelists, first of all, the second. It seems uh, that uh, you will uh, also ask uh, this question. Sure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And uh, I'm sure that we'll get an, uh, time for also question and answer, and these issues will again come around. Uh, uh, thank you, Ambassador uh, Alexander, for your uh, 
deliberation where uh, Mr. Dar, uh, basically he talked about the Russia's legitimate uh, concern about the security issue. And uh, he mentioned that Russia was voicing the concern to NATO about his security for long. And um, Ukraine was publicly was stating that it was not ready to implement Minsk agreement. So that was one of the diplomatic uh, initiative failure that he was mentioning. And also he mentioned about NATO's expansion to the East, uh, which is also one of the uh, major concern for Russia. And he said that Russia tried to solve the security concern diplomatically for uh, at least for 10, 12 years, uh, but they didn't uh, get this uh, dependable place for diplomacy. So we do now uh, uh, have the last panelist uh, uh, who is our own uh, Ambassador Shoidul Haq, the uh, from North South University. Let me introduce him. Ambassador Shoydulov is the professorial fellow at uh, South Asian Institute of Policy and Governance of North South. He is also currently occupying the ICCR Bangabandhu Chair at the University of Delhi, India. He is a senior advisor on migration and humanitarian policy of IOM Dhaka. Uh, Mr. Hawk also served as the Foreign Secretary of Bangladesh from January 2013 to December 2019. So over to you, Ambassador Shoyidula. Thank you very much, uh, uh, distinguished chair, uh, distinguished panelists, uh, a very interesting uh, uh, discussions. Uh, so I, I was wondering uh, which thread I pull uh, to build my own uh, uh, intervention. Uh, I, I have a, before I go into a presentation, which would be kind of a Two part. I'll, I'll try and share how I see diplomacy uh, in the context of a conflict in general and in this particular case. And then we'll go deeper into it that why uh, diplomacy seems to be not functioning as has been revealed by almost all the panelists. So, so my first question is who is winning? When there is a war or a conflict or a play or a game, you know, the human uh, uh, ask who is the winning? I don't think anyone is winning. But who is losing? If you ask me, I'll say everyone is losing. Even sitting in Bangladesh, we are losing because of many, many uh, issues, including the inflation and the rest of it. So in the losing game, diplomacy is actually lost the ground which it has gained over the years. So that's my uh, opening. Salvo. Uh, diplomacy is often understood as tools, methods, modes, institutions employed by state because we assume that today we are talking about state diplomacy, not the people's diplomacy or non-state actors diplomacy, but that's also a, a large bigger field, which I will not bring today in the discussion. So therefore, uh, it is basically to implement state policy. So if you do not have uh, just in the right kind of a fair kind of a diplomat, uh, foreign policy objective of the conflicting parties, you don't have uh, uh, the kind of a diplomacy that we are talking about. Diplomacy is nothing but a tool employed by states. So let's, let me uh, clear on this because we'll be often using the word diplomacy instead of foreign policy. So <clears throat> that's one. The other one is that uh, despite popular understanding, we assume especially those outside and never practice diplomacy as an agent of state, that uh, it is always meant to create uh, alternative to violence, peace. Not essentially. Diplomacies are often used by states to create right condition to win a war. Think of Hitler. Think of Napoleon. They have used diplomacy to win a war. So. Diplomacy could be used in both ways, and we see a vivid example of that currently in play in the in the in the Eastern uh, uh, theater. So that's the premise which I'll I'll try and use. Now, when we were sort of a chain as a diplomat, we were said that when diplomacy starts, war ends. When war ends, diplomacy starts. That particular dictum is no longer valid. It looks like, and it was very clear uh, by. Uh, both by the, uh, by the ambassadors, that uh, they talk, they fight, they fight and they talk, which I think uh, is a new kind of a manifestations of, uh, of diplomacy that we see, which we didn't actually see, uh, especially in the beginning of any war, 
in, in the in the um, in the World War One when all alliances were talking, the allies were talking not across uh, the uh, the front line. They were talking, which is very vivid now. So it's also something uh, you need to uh, take into account. Now, uh, coming back to this, uh, I think. Uh, in terms of manifestation of diplomacy in the conflict situation, I see three kinds of manifestation. One, and, and it doesn't only uh, limit to uh, the uh, Eastern Europe, uh, but have a large, larger uh, uh, manifestation. One is that we, we end up doing diplomacy uh, uh, today uh, in a highly uh, competitive uh, uh, sort of a situation which sort of help us to manage or navigate in a, uh, between two power rivalries. So that's one. Uh, and, and often we end up in the middle, especially the small states. So the second one is that we do diplomacy to stabilize situation, conflict, disaster, whatever you call it. And the third one is do diplomacy to create institutions, law and norms. All these three sectors of manifestation or function of diplomacy is currently almost uh, uh, we told in the uh, Ukraine, Russia front. So this is this is reality, uh, uh, and so it looks like that in Ukraine Russia front, uh, diplomacy has become a hostage of geopolitics and great power rivalry. So that's uh, that's my concluding thing in terms of sharing as to how I see diplomacy functioning and not functioning. Now, in order to find out why uh, in, in the negotiation discipline you say why the two parties refuse to talk or you know they talk passing each other not to the core of their interest so what is the core interest of the two major uh, confronting parties in uh, in eastern europe one is the russia as i read it and the other one is the larger western uh, community now uh, let, let me also qualify that as a non-participating state, Bangladesh, in this conflict directly, we are we are kind of a reader from little far away. So my assumptions may not be re duly reflecting the position of the European Union or Western world, to use the world, more encompassing, bringing in all Australia to uh, to Canada, and then um, uh, then looking at uh, Russia. Uh, and it has been very clear, the Ambassador Alexander's statement, that they are indeed concerned with their security for years, school, including um, Minsk uh, agreement, which I think uh, utterly failed everyone. Uh, and, and then we need to look at it uh, you know, because it has also affected smaller states around the conflict zone and also away. Uh, and, 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 and Russia, I think, rightly pointed out that we have been going door to door to tell everyone that let's address our security concern in the line of Minsk agreement where two major European powers participated as a guarantor. So there must have something gone wrong that we need to look at. So, so that's one. The second one is that uh, Russia thinks that military activities and peace go, peace can go together. And I'll tell you why I'm saying it. They don't see peace and military activities as a separate of statecraft. Now, this has been very clear in their uh, uh, 2015 national security strategy, which has said that political, military, diplomacy, economic, and information campaigns are implemented by the state of Russia to ensure strategic deterrence. So we shouldn't, it shouldn't come as a surprise when uh, Russia uses its, uh, its force to ensure its security because it's their stated policy, like the NATO policy, like the uh, West, um, uh, like the American policy. So why should it come as a surprise? It shouldn't, as part of the diplomacy that they take it. And the third one is that Russia, rightly or wrongly, feels that West is the problem. And it creates insecurity for them. It's a, it's a world of new order that we are looking at. And fourth, which little controversial, that end will justify means. If Russia can ensure its security through this 
aggression invasion things will be all right and we'll see how it how it goes so that's how russia looks at this issue so that's why negotiation is difficult and unless and until the other party recognizes these concerns especially the security concern there's no negotiation there's no peace there's no diplomacy now let us look the western world looks at uh, at, at this uh, issue now russia's invasion of ukraine is an attempt to redraw the the borders of eastern europe forcefully that's how the western world looks at it violating all the norms of territorial integrity independence sovereignty of the states so it's a major violation of un charter it's not that the first time it is happening it has happened all over the world but this time it has happened in the heart of europe when things go wrong in europe europe thinks the whole world is going upside down that's that's also an issue it may not be the case when things happen in korea when things happen in vietnam when things happen in bangladesh when things happen in myanmar no big deal but when europe gets the heat things starts getting uncomfortable so that's something we should uh, also think those were little outside and small states now uh, therefore the russian act in ukraine cannot be tolerated they have to be defeated that's how the western world comes to it and with this mindset it's very difficult to sit on a negotiating table because the negotiate that taking place between ukraine and russia is basically russia versus west take it or leave it uh, i don't i'm not privy to this but whatever i could read from outside now russia's uh, this um, aggression in ukraine is a direct threat not only to the international order which is anyway crumbling not functioning so it was just waiting for something to uh, aggravate advance the uh, 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 the new regime but it's for the first time it has actually threatened after bosnia uh, after threatened the european security whether it has helped europeans to put their act together or it has brought in much more fallouts we the time will say now with this mindset if they go to the table is very difficult to have a diplomacy running in function. Now, what are the avenues are open for diplomacy? One is the bilateral. Hmm? Second is the trilateral. Thanks to uh, Turkey, uh, Turkey has always been very active in, in mediating conflicts. And the ambassador has rightly pointed out, Ambassador Mustafa, that they have been leading role, uh, including in Asia and Europe, because they, are, they, have, a, uh, they have a stake in both uh, the world both the geography and they have also doing a, a very appreciable role in this so that's the trilateral but see how how much it brings the regional european union has taken a very strong hard position vis-a-vis -vis russia i'm sure that it has been well thought out now under this situation they actually cannot facilitate a a a, a peaceful settlement of uh, the war or dispute so is the nato so is the OSCE. now who is left out? UN. UN is dead. Long live UN. As far as the European issues are concerned. UN was created out of a European conflict, and I think it will be buried, sorry to use the word, because of the Europe, European crisis. We have, those who are non-European, has a huge faith on UN, but the Europe may not have enough faith on UN. That's why we see that UN has been pushed out of its role for which it was created the whole charter so so uh, i i know i know i'm coming to close i will conclude my remarks what i'm saying that diplomacy has to be given a chance to play its role the way turkey is playing a role the way india is trying to play a role here but if you don't have your foreign policy objectives to reach a settlement of an issue that you don't have diplomacy whatever diplomacy could bring in you know except limited humanitarian and other areas so is the is diplomacy irrelevant or dead certainly not it has never been it goes through ups and down but it it is the last hope because at the end it is the peaceful settlement that ambassador mustafa has rightly pointed out it will not be settled in the battlefield because even if there is a uh, status quo reached out of war in the battlefield the vibration of the war its impact on 
world economic system, its impact on food security, it impacts on every aspect of the relationship will continue till we really sit down and have a new charter for, for the world, not for Europe only. That's what we often go wrong. We, the solution is not in Europe, solution is in the world. So the Ukraine war, shall we wait till there is a military battlefield decision or a victory of one party like Second World War or First World War? No, I think we should try and bring in a substantive change, but the Europe which or European Union, which could have taken a lead, has, has been um, has taken such a strong view of the of the conflict. It's like a you know die or do. It's Ukraine dies, Europe dies, Europe dies, Ukraine dies. That kind of a equation has been stated at the very high level. So there's not much hope that we can fit in European Union. So the, we have to look for other who are relatively new or relatively neutral. Uh, look at Asia, look at Turkey, it's already involved. Look at India, look at Malaysia. Those are still uh, on the uh, 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 on in between and not taking a very strong position. And as I said, they have the be better um, position to mediate. And we have to also remember that this, this is the beginning of a multipolar world. So without R Russian Federation, without China, without India, there is no world order. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Shoyulak, uh, uh, for bringing the perspective from global south. And that is also very fascinating because um, as we have all seen that we all are getting affected. So we are now at the end of, or end of the first round and we will very quickly go to the second round, which is a question answer. We already received a very good number of questions uh, from our Facebook page and also the students. They have given some written questions. I would like to give the opportunity of the uh, questions from the students first uh, to be raised. And then probably if uh, time permits, we will come to our faculty members. Usually it is other way around. But in this case, because we are seeing overwhelming participation of the students, the young generations, and uh, to uh, give some enthusiasm and uh, encouragement to them. So I'm taking the questions from them first. Uh, but before uh, raising the questions, I just related with uh, what um, Ambassador Shodulak was saying that uh, uh, according to even uh, Russian strategic papers also, military intervention is also a part of diplomacy. And that's why we're seeing that uh, in this war, uh, in, according to him, uh, uh, there are all losers. But one of the uh, one of our uh, students raised a very important question. That um, he his argument is uh, I'm, re I'm reading it from the statement that uh, Russia is probably winning militarily. Russia has already lost the information and public opinion war, and in the global north. And the whole world is losing because of economic war. So I find it very interesting. He said that Russia is winning militarily. Russia has already lost information war and also public opinion war in the global north. And the whole world is losing because of economic war. So comprehensively, there is no single winner or single loser. And as also Ambassador Shohit was saying, so in this situation, is negotiation possible? So I would like to uh, request our first panelist, come back to our first panelist, uh, Dr. Nicole, uh, to respond if she wants. Dr. Nicole, do you want to respond? Yes, sir. I, I think I can do that. Um, I'm not sure who is um, winning militarily right now. Um, I mean, there are uh, Russian advances on the battlefield, that's for sure, in the East and Donbass during the last weeks. But how it will all end, as uh, my colleague from Norway already said, we are very bad in uh, doing this kind of prognosis. However, what is absolutely clear is that Russia has lost economically already with uh, the sanctions in place that will hit its economy very hard for the years to come. But um, before I go on, let me make um, two clarifications, which I think are very important to our discussion. Um, the first one is um, there is no declaration of war needed to uh, wage uh, a war and a special military operation, I'm sorry, Ambassador, is nonsensical if a country is militarily invading another country and trying to conquer it. And 
your troops were not um, 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 being singled only to the east, but you were trying to conquer Ukraine at whole. And I'm sorry, this is a full-fledged war under international law. And this is also very important. This is not a perspective of the West, but waging a war of aggression is against international law, and international law is not merely a Western idea, but it is an idea to which all 194 members of the United Nations have signed to and should comply by. And maybe the second clarification, because I think this is important if we're thinking about how shall we get back to the table? How shall we get to a negotiated settlement between um, um, Ukraine and Russia? And um, you were mentioning that the European uh, Union is so one-sided that it cannot lead a diplomatic initiative. But I think what we have to talk then about too is where does it come from? What is the experience that make the European Union have this hard stance toward the Russian Federation and deciding to support the Ukrainian side? And the decision uh, or the experience is that Russia is not living up to its commitment, that it is not credible. It is bullying its neighbors. It is threatening EU and NATO member states. Think about the Baltic states, for instance. Think about Sweden or uh, Finland in that regard. It has recurrently used military force to change borders in Europe. And I'm sorry, but this is the fundamental principle on which the cooperative security system in Europe is built on in the Paris uh, Charta if, uh, of 1991. So um, the question that the European Union is posing to itself is where will Russia stop? And this is why the decision is not to give in here, because we simply do not know whether Russia will support other borders in the future. And this is why this position of the European Union is in place. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And from there, I can see the linkage with the second question. And that I would like to request our second panelist, Professor Gunhil, to answer. So our student is saying, one of our students, that since Russia is in advantageous position in terms of military achievements, it will not negotiate until full military victory is achieved. Russia wants to see all Russian-speaking people from the former Soviet Union territories come under a single umbrella. What actually the Russian-speaking population want, in, uh, want uh, either in Ukraine or our other neighboring countries? Uh, is it clear the question, Professor Gunhe? Yeah. Sorry, had to unmute. Uh, I, I think so. If I understand correctly, uh, uh, our student is is asking, well, what what are the Russian speaking populations actually thinking about this whole thing? If I can put it in a in a short form, and I think that's a that's a really good question. And it also, um, it's an interesting question that uh, highlights a, a very complex problem. Does language determine our, our affiliation to nationalist sentiments? Uh, Ukraine is an interesting case in this regard. And I think many countries that have uh, multilingual language use are interesting cases because many, many Ukrainians speak Russian. Uh, some as their first language, some as their second language. Um, and so the, the, the inclination to be either pro-Ukrainian or pro-Russian uh, is very difficult to determine on the basis of what language one speaks. So, uh, and that it depends very much on, on people's political um, interests and affiliations. So I, I'm, most of the Ukrainians I know, their mother tongue is, is Russian and uh, they are not necessarily all pro Russia in, in this particular uh, situation. Um, but I think what's really important is having an understanding of what the, the, the sentiments are on the ground, so to speak. We're seeing uh, increasingly the, the relevance of the role of people the average civilian in the engagement of conflict and war. And I'm not saying just as quite often, you know, civilians are relegated to this role of, uh, well, if you just go locally, you know, you will find peace. Not necessarily. People are willing to fight 
for what they believe in. And we're, we're seeing that as well uh, on whether they are Russian or Ukrainian speaking. We see that on, on those who are fighting for the Ukrainian side. Um, there are undoubtedly those who are both Russian speaking and also more supportive of the, the Russian intervention. So you, that, that definitely exists in, uh, in, in this particular conflict. Trying to weed or uh, figure out you know, who, who is saying what is, um, is the more difficult uh, question. Um, it will be interesting to see how this plays out, but I suspect it will, um, like, unfortunately, as usual, it will be states, uh, the state apparatus that will decide these things, including the use of uh, military force. Okay, so uh, let me comment uh, some uh, words about uh, this answer. Nancy is, uh, uh, how to say, uh, not, uh, she do not understand what has happened in Ukraine, because in Ukraine, Russian language was forbidden. Russian newspapers were forbidden. TV channels were closed. Everything was gone. Okay, let us look in Europe. Imagine that in France, Germany language will be prohibited, or somewhere in other countries. Here in uh, Bangladesh, you, in the constitution, you have them more than uh, 10 languages. In India, if you will uh, take a uh, banknote of uh, India, you will see that uh, it is written on uh, 17 languages, yeah, I'm not mistaken, 13 or 17. So nobody has forbidden, forbidden these languages. Why it has been in Ukraine? This is the answer. Why people have started their uh, they wanted to be uh, free of uh, Ukraine in 19, uh, 2014, 2014. This is the matter. You should understand the, uh, the roots, not to speak in general. Okay, okay we'll come back, uh, Ambassador, to you also. Some well, I'll, if, I, if I can just say, I Thank do you. understand that happened and, and that there uh, were laws imposed a, a, against the Russian language. I wasn't asked that question. I just answered what I thought I had been asked, but I am aware of that. So I'll just leave it at that. Thanks. So we have now, uh, I, I can see that the very interesting, but also challenging questions are there. Uh, there is a question to our uh, Turkey ambassador, and um, it's also a little bit. So the student is asking that Turkey is part of NATO and giving military drone to Ukraine, how can it be neutral in negotiation? It's part of NATO Turkey. So how can it be a, a neutral mediator? No, as I said, <clears throat> we have a strategic uh, partnership with Ukraine, which uh, started long before this war uh, has started. Uh, so most of the uh, cooperation took place before uh, anything uh, started. So, um, you know, Turkey has independent foreign policy with individual countries, including Russia and Ukraine. Uh, as I said, we have very good relations with Russia uh, on many different issues, uh, while we disagree on other issues. Uh, so, uh, for example, and many regional flashpoints, including Syria, Libya, South Caucasus, Black Sea, Bosnia, Kosovo, Moldova, even in the Mediterranean, we face off and disagree with Russia. Um, but on other issues, we, we agree with Russia. So, you know, countries do not have permanent sort of positions on every single issue. You consider in diplomacy uh, circumstances in which you operate. And uh, according to those circumstances, you determine your foreign policy. Uh, as you can see, um, also, for example, as regards to sanctions in principle, uh, regardless of the targeted country in question, we enforce UN sanctions and do not automatically participate in unilateral restrictive measures and sanctions uh, which are decided in our absence. So. This doesn't mean that we are opposing the sanctions being imposed on Russia, uh, but we are doubtful about the results of sanctions on Russia in the past. So uh, as you can see, uh, this is a very nuanced diplomacy and uh, it's easy to uh, you know, um, take uh, hard positions which 
do not allow for any room for maneuver. And if you don't have room for maneuver in diplomacy, you cannot strike uh, a just solution to a very intractable uh, international problem. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador. I hope that uh, the student got the answer. Uh, we have uh, so many questions. I just have another question specifically uh, asked to the uh, Russian, um, uh, Russian ambassador here in the panel. The question is, we saw that Russia started the war for preventing Ukraine from joining NATO, but now Ukraine officially and unofficially declared that they would not join. Then why Russia is still continuing this war? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, in the Constitution of uh, Ukraine, it is written that uh, uh, they will uh, join, their, their goal is uh, to join uh, NATO countries, first of all. When we proposed uh, in the uh, late 90s and uh, at the, uh, at, uh, in the November uh, 2021 20, uh, uh, to sign uh, these uh, agreements between NATO and uh, between uh, us and uh, United States, uh, we wanted comprehensive uh, security for everybody. Nobody has uh, mentioned here that uh, uh, starting from 1991, there was a uh, five expansion of NATO. Don't forget that about it. Now they want uh, to fill and uh, 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 Swedish to, uh, to join them. Okay, so much was a talk about atrocities in Butcher. As I, I remember, there was uh, some panel established uh, to, uh, to check what has uh, happened in Bucha. Now would, nobody has presented its results. What has, uh, has happened in Bucha? You see? Why uh, you have forgotten that starting from 2014, uh, 14,000 uh, uh, people die in Donetsk and uh, Lugansk, sheltered. You're speaking about a refugee uh, crisis. Do you know how many uh, refugees are, have uh, taken shelter from uh, this uh, 20, uh, 24th of uh, 22nd, even 22nd of February? 1.6 uh, million uh, people in Russia. So the crisis everywhere is it is. This is the matter. That's why we propose uh, let us have comprehensive security pact. United States they have not agreed. NATO have not agreed to it. Thank you. Another question, Ambassador. Um, uh, it's again, again our um, uh, our second panelist also mentioned that in this war we realize even political scientists, military strategies that how difficult to even make a projection. Uh, but now this is a question regarding projection. What sort of sovereignty? The, uh, Russia want to see for Ukraine in future. Does it want to see Ukraine divided into several parts and uh, one part become uh, or getting, uh, uh, I, do not, I cannot read the kind of thing that probably is mentioned that uh, uh, getting part of uh, Russia formally. And so what is Russian plan for, a, for the future Ukrainian territory? Thank you very much. You should understand that I am just ambassador here. I don't know what kind of military plans are there, first of all. When uh, this uh, special operation was declared, uh, uh, President Putin has said, we want uh, Ukraine uh, to is exist as a sovereign uh, country. But we can see that there is no sovereignty now in uh, this country. Everything is dictated by... Uh, Britishers, uh, European, and uh, Americans. They would like to fight uh, till uh, last uh, Ukraines. Why they are supplying heavy weapons? Do you know that uh, people are dying in Donetsk? That uh, they are shelting just civilians, civilians. Not a single uh, military man is uh, Donetsk or any other uh, uh, points of uh, Donetsk or uh, Lugansk. I can read you how many people have died. It will take time. Nobody is listening. Everybody is speaking a butcher. Okay? What does it mean, butcher? Because our forces were withdrawn from butcher three days ahead of those materials which were published. Look at some Western countries' correspondence. They're speaking that, okay, there was no butcher. 
it was uh, everything was staged. It's uh, the same uh, like it was staged in uh, uh, Syria by white uh, tasks. Chemical uh, weapons are used. Okay, everybody is blaming that Russia will use chemical weapons. Don't forget that the chemical weapons were destroyed in Russia long ago. The only country who possess weapons, military weapons, it is the United States. We, we are speaking of biological uh, weapons. So many, many, more than 30 laboratories were in Ukraine. Now we are speaking about uh, monkey fox. Yes? You see, uh, there are six laboratories studying this disease in Nigeria. So look in the matter. Everybody of students should uh, read not only newspapers or uh, blogs or something, but it is written by Westerners. It should be read from many points of view. You should get information and you should judge yourself. Maybe you remember at the beginning in February this year, or at the beginning of uh, March, I have written an open letter to your uh, editors of newspapers and uh, TV channels that they are publishing only materials from Reuters, FPN, uh, Bloomberg, and some uh, other Western countries. Now I can see that there are some changes because some newspapers are publishing agencies. It means that they are taking some news from one agency, from another, third, and like that. But it's a little bit changed. Of course, nobody will win in this war. Everybody will lose. And we should think about uh, the future of uh, our countries. This is the matter. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. So we have uh, just for last written question. I'm sorry, students, you asked many questions, couldn't take because our faculties also, they wanted to ask some questions or give some comments. So last uh, question from our, one of the director of financial aid. He asked the question uh, and I would uh, request Ambassador Shoydulhok to answer this. What would be the impact of the decision of Sweden and Finland to join NATO at this stage? Is it a good diplomacy or will it only instigate the conflict? Ambassador Shoydulhok. Thank you very much. I wish you had asked this to one of our Western uh, academicians uh, because uh, it's also very revealing that after what, uh, 200 years of neutrality, uh, these two countries uh, were forced to take a decision which wasn't uh, easy uh, on anyone's part actually. So that's uh, something very revealing. I'm, I'm sure that we, people will do PhDs on it uh, at an appropriate time uh, as to why this happened. And also I think our Russian friends and colleagues should also see this, that uh, the, 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 the reason for which they went into this uh, has backfired, you know, without taking any side, uh, I, I can see that. So they have to really rethink that what went, what went wrong, uh, the status quo that we were seeing uh, after the Second World War, which was dented a little in 2014, but you know, the Western world also accepted it. Uh, uh, because of the Russian uh, uh, rise, but uh, it, it was stretched too much. So that's something very interesting. Uh, but would there be a, a chance to uh, reflect on future, sir? Or uh, this is the end? Okay. okay uh, thank you. It, 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 would, would we get some bit of a time later to reflect on future? Sorry, we have been uh, disconnected for a few seconds. I could not listen properly. I said, um, uh, would, would there be an uh, opportunity given to the panelists to uh, sort of give a concluding thoughts? Uh, I, that, I don't think so, but if you want to say something, I can tell it now. I yeah. think okay, I now okay. thank you very much. I just want to, because, you know, the, uh, the webinar is taking place in NSU, uh, and we're so happy that so many students joined in. Uh, uh, I, I, have, uh, I have two messages to give to uh, our younger minds. Uh, one is that uh, the, the world is naturally going through a huge change in every respect. Uh, it was going through even um, when we didn't have the uh, war uh, in the Eastern Europe. Uh, so you should keep your mind open, listen to both sides and have your own decision. This is the first time that the Asian countries, the smaller countries have got a chance to raise their voice in, in the order that is being uh, set 
for them for the next 50 to 100 years. So in the last century, it was Westerners who decided on how the world should look like and behave and function. Now it is everybody's chance because of the situation. Uh, we and you as a younger generation should have very strong opinion on this uh, and make it articulated uh, that how the future world will should look like. Uh, it shouldn't be only uh, through the Western eyes, it should be from the Eastern eyes as well. So that's why the South voice is so important. And whatever order you're talking about, there'll be no order without Russia, without China, without us being actively engaged, unlike Second World War. This is my request to my, uh, my students. Uh, and I, I do it also here in India. So they should be more actively engaged because it is their future, not our future. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. It was a very, very important statement. And uh, I can see that our students for last almost one and one hour and 40, 45 minutes, they are, they are very patiently sitting and listening. And this is a, a little bit unusual in a class day. So I'm really grateful that our students joined. Thank you all for uh, uh, coming here and joining and listening and giving your inputs and those very, very uh, important inputs. Before I go to our now uh, faculty members, uh, good, I'd like to request our uh, Norwegian or, or this German uh, uh, panelist. Uh, would you like to uh, make any comment about this uh, question regarding Finland and Sweden's uh, uh, proposal to be included in NATO? Is any uh, specific observation about it? Okay, Professor Gunhild. Gun um, I would uh, like to echo the comments from our uh, colleague, um, Ambassador uh, Shahidul. I think um, he makes a lot of very Im important points, uh, both that uh, the that more than just you know the West, however we define that, versus the non-West, however we define that, because these are also very uh, yeah interesting, not always clearly defined terms, but. Um, it would be, uh, it has also, as uh, Ambassador uh, Shahidul has mentioned, the, the initiative to try to curtail NATO expansion has obviously um, backfired on, on this particular front because this is a decision definitely made by Sweden and Finland. It's not NATO has decided to include Sweden and Finland. These two countries made the choice themselves um, using their own political processes. And this will also be something debated for a long time to come. What the impact should be in Europe, and it's also about European security, for, uh, for all the failings that these European uh, organizations have, both NATO and the EU as, as the, the main ones, uh, this intervention has, um, I would say, uh, more strongly solidified even if it's temporary, but has strongly more solidified a notion of, uh, of collectivity and a collective security. And I'm not entirely sure that was the Russian objective. I'm particularly seeing this from the point of view of, of NATO. Now in the North, if uh, Finland and uh, Sweden become a part of, um, of NATO, you have a very strong, significant presence of at least the NATO umbrella. The, the, the same militaries are there. The cooperation between NATO, between Finland, Sweden, and Norway, and NATO in general has always been actually very strong. So it's not, so in practice, a lot of things will remain the same, but under a NATO umbrella, they will be better coordinated and you have more the symbolism of this uh, sort of Northern fortress of, of NATO in the North. And that'll be interesting to see how that all plays out. Okay, thank you, Professor Gunil. We'll, uh, we are already 15 minutes ahead, uh, already about, uh, past the, uh, our expected time. I would like to finish it by next 15 minutes uh, with the permission of the panelists. So I would now would like to invite our uh, faculty members, but I just mentioned that we only can give you two minutes to whatever the comments you want to make or uh, the questions you want to raise. And two minutes means two minutes. So Professor Nurzaman first, and then uh, we have um, Dr. Rizwan and Dr. Norman Swazo. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it was really nice uh, to listen to the panelists, uh, especially to the 
uh, two distinguished ambassadors uh, from Russia and to here. So it was really nice that our students ha have had the opportunity to listen to you directly. And uh, at North South University, I know that uh, this is for the first time that uh, uh, ambassadors from Russia and Turkey are here. Okay, uh, that's fine, but um, let me make only three uh, observations. Uh, first one, uh, it is not really time for diplomacy to work at this stage to resolve the uh, Russia-Ukraine war. Uh, let the warring parties get tired of fighting, and after that, I think there can be some opportunity to talk of uh, diplomacy. And um, uh, so far, we have seen that uh, because of inflexible, insurmountable red lines, diplomacy is being denied any role to play. Uh, so Russia, is, Russia has preeminent security concerns. Ukraine is ready to get back the territories uh, with the help of its uh, Western allies. So uh, the permanent members of the UN Security Council are directly, indirectly involved in this particular war. So UN has no particular role to play here at this time until it is allowed to play a, a useful role uh, in the future. Uh, so in that sense, the UN may be dead, but it is not totally dead. Uh, it, it still has some hope. Uh, it gives us a uh, hope, really. Uh, so my second observation is that um, uh, there has been the rise of the collective West, um, including the NATO plus the EU. And this collective West is becoming more and more hegemonic uh, in the world. So it gives lessons to all other countries in the world how best to manage their relationships with the collective West. Because if any powerful country goes against the West, there, should, there is expected to be a collective uh, West uh, response. And the Chinese are particularly watching and learning uh, from this uh, particular uh, development. And thirdly, for the, North, uh, for the Southern countries, the global South, uh, they have a lot to learn from this uh, particular development. Uh, mainly because of their poor economic, political, military conditions. So they need to uh, redesign, uh, uh, redevelop their foreign policy choices and responses in terms of new developments, new realities taking place uh, in the uh, world. So now we see that uh, there are actually three rising power centers. Number one, the West, collective West, second, Russia, third, China. And the third uh, and the global South countries should actually balance their relationships uh, in terms of uh, the three centers of power in the world. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Some this is a comment. So, the journal, so Dr. Rizwan, very quickly, two minutes, please. Uh, th thank you, sir, for giving me the opportunity to raise a question. And also, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our distinguished panelists. In particular, I'm particularly impressed uh, by the uh, question handling and the presentations of our uh, diplomats. And, and they have perhaps shown that why they are diplomats. They have handled so tough uh, questions so smartly and so uh, in, in a very uh, civilized way. Now, my uh, question would be to His Excellency Ambassador from Russia, that where do you precisely draw the demarcation line between quote unquote special military operation and aggression? As a student of international law, my lens of looking at this may be a bit narrow, a, paro a bit parochial, maybe some realistic scholars may say too narrow, but where do you really draw the line? And secondly, what does it mean for smaller nations? What if China wants to launch a quote unquote special military operation in Taiwan? Would the world be better off? Are we heading towards uh, the days of Thucydides that powerful do what they want or what they can, and the weak do what they must. Uh, thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. First of all, uh, the second question, I don't know what will uh, Chinese do, Beijing will do, and uh, let us not uh, speculate about this. Uh, so many speculations, especially from Western countries, what will happen with uh, China is uh, invading uh, Taiwan. Let us uh, happen what will happen. The second, uh, first uh, question, of course, uh, how to draw, uh, we have not declared uh, any uh, war. If, uh, war, it means uh, that we will uh, destroy everything. Uh, you can uh, see so many people are uh, saying, and especially panelists, uh, that uh, we can see that uh, there is no um, uh, war uh, is uh, lost uh, by Russia and so on and so on. Don't forget, uh, first of all, that uh, we would like to limit uh, the casualties of civilian 
people. Uh, take, for example, what was done in Yugoslavia. Everybody has forgotten that in the middle of uh, Europe in 1991, the country was destroyed. And um, so many countries will uh, establish the, you, let us speak about uh, territorial integrity. The question is whether it is a, a territorial integrity. Nobody spoke at that time about uh, this. F take, for example, uh, Kosovo, which was uh, created. Kosovo was created. The, it was declared uh, by Western countries that uh, we will recognize this country. Okay, when in Crimea, referendum was uh, held, nobody uh, was saying that it is illegal. Everybody was speaking that it is illegal. But why you denied uh, first of one country and uh, recognize uh, the second country? So it's a double standard. This is uh, understandable. And uh, casualties, about casualties. Once again, I would like to repeat, we would like to reduce uh, the uh, civil casualties as much as possible. We do not bombard as it was a uh, bombardment of uh, Yugoslavia or Libya or Iraq or uh, take, for example, uh, uh, Afghanistan and some other countries. So uh, Western countries, uh, they, especially Americans, uh, they don't see about uh, uh, civil casualties. This is just uh, uh, doesn't matter for them. For us, it uh, matters because uh, many people, maybe they are Russian speaking, we would, do not want uh, them to die. Now look what is uh, going on. Nobody wants to recognize that this, uh, all these uh, heavy uh, weapons are deployed in civil, uh, in houses, in, at schools, uh, in hospitals, and so on and so on. It takes a lot of time to use precise uh, missiles and uh, uh, shells to destroy these uh, uh, heavy weapons. By the way, Western countries are supplying these weapons. Take, for example, United States, Poland, German, uh, each and every country is supplying. Even uh, my dear friends, uh, uh, Turkish ambassador, they are supplying bar Barakta. They would like to be uh, neutral. But nevertheless, uh, they supply no weapons. We do not supply weapons to anybody. These are the matters. Uh, that's why, of course, it's very difficult uh, to say uh, our goal, which was declared by the president at that uh, time, that we would like to denazify because Nazism is in Ukraine. You look at um, uh, books uh, and uh, some other materials which uh, uh, are held uh, by uh, Russian uh, forces. You, uh, some exhibition even was uh, arranged in uh, Moscow regarding these uh, matters. Then uh, they were destroying people. They are from uh, Western parts of uh, Ukraine. They do not recognize uh, this uh, uh, Donbass, Lugansk, uh, and uh, other, uh, other cities as their own. Because uh, some time ago they were in Poland. Now uh, the question was asked uh, whether will uh, Ukraine survive? I don't know. Because uh, you see, our goal was uh, that, uh, okay, we want uh, these uh, republics to be independent. You do not recognize a means agreement. Okay. Now the situation has changed. Mm. But Pol Poland is looking at the uh, western part of uh, Ukraine. Don't forget, uh, forget about uh, Hungary, which has its own also citizens, because passports were given uh, to uh, citizens of Ukraine. By the way, when uh, Russian language was forbidden, uh, some uh, Hungary country, Hungary, uh, they declared that we will not recognize Ukraine, that we will not talk with them. That's why uh, there was an exception that for, for uh, this uh, uh, language, Okay, it's a good. Now Poland, uh, just recently, uh, President Zelensky and uh, Prime Minister of Poland declared that there will be uh, no border between our countries so that uh, uh, Polish people can serve in police, in security uh, organizations, uh, in uh, courts and so on. What does it mean? There is no uh, independence, no sovereignty of this country at all because they do not want it to help themselves. Okay. 
Okay, yeah, I can continue. So uh, you uh, to give to you so many examples. Uh, no, 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 yeah, yeah, we do understand. So I have a last question from uh, Professor Norman Swazo, the faculty from North South University. Thank you. My uh, question is for both ambassadors present, if you would please. Uh, a former teacher of mine, uh, Richard A. Falk, uh, Professor Emeritus of International Law and Practice at Princeton University, has published to say that he believes there are in fact three wars ongoing in Ukraine. The first, which is the actual battlefield armed conflict on the territory of Ukraine. The second is a proxy war between NATO and Russia. And the third is a geopolitical war between the United States and Russia. Do the two of you agree with that particular assessment? Thank you. Uh, maybe we can come to the Turkey uh, ambassador first and then Thank you for the question. Uh, I think uh, as ac <clears throat> academic uh, scholars uh, have to do, this question is uh, multi-layered, obviously. Um, and I really enjoy uh, reading uh, various uh, academic approaches to uh, very complex problems uh, because they uh, delve into complexities and uh, lay, uh, identify layers of uh, what we see on the surface. So um, I wouldn't disagree with this uh, analysis because it kind of um, um, tell us that uh, international politics is complex with uh, armed, especially when there's armed conflict. Uh, it's not just about the military uh, aspect of it. It's also political. Uh, it's also about um, geopolitics. Um, it has a lot of different uh, dimensions. So I think that question, uh, that explanation that your colleague has provided uh, has some merit. I would be very happy to look more into it. If there's a way to uh, to share a link or uh, the text, uh, then I could make a better comment on it. Thank you. Uh, I will be happy to uh, send the link to you if you provide me your contact information afterward. Thank you. Let me also add a few words. I also do agree with my colleagues that it's uh, sometimes uh, academic discussions about diplomacy. It's academic discussion. There are some practical uh, ways which we do, uh, that to uh, happen, this limit, especially. I mentioned why we have started this uh, uh, limited uh, military operation starting from 1991. We requested Western countries uh, not to expand and so on and so on. This is uh, the matter. The, this why practical measures uh, very important. The second thing, uh, don't expect from us, from diplomats, to give you a definite answer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, we have uh, just two more uh, person to, uh, I'll come back to you. We have uh, our, uh, one of the directors of the university, uh, very quickly, Mr. Mabu. Okay. So very quickly to actually this question, uh, this question is to um, Ambassador, Russian amb Ambassador. So we know that actually we, uh, there are lots of weapons are being um, sent to Ukraine uh, from USA, uh, it's like Javelin, from Britain, it is MLO. Recently, America is also sending um, a long range artillery like uh, Himbras M M142. Uh, but we, we never heard anything from Russian um, weapons and, and their um, effectiveness. So how you are handling those things? Okay, thank you very much. We have uh, every uh, day we have two briefings of our uh, military uh, spokesman, military of defense. Uh, that's why, dear friends, I advise uh, you to uh, subscribe to our channels. Uh, it means uh, we have uh, uh, Twitter, we have uh, Facebook, uh, and and uh, our uh, what Telegram and Telegram. So. Uh, we have requested organizers of uh, this seminar to distribute it to you. Then you will have uh, the uh, full information what is going on. 
how these weapons are destroyed, uh, what, uh, what is, is uh, their effectiveness. But effectiveness is, uh, very, uh, once again, I would, I would like to underline, they are using, uh, I mean, Ukraine uh, military, they are using these weapons not against uh, uh, Russian uh, military units, they are using it against uh, civilians. This is the matter, and people are dying. Okay, so we have last comment before we come to the chair of the session. Uh, Pro Vice Chancellor. So I would now request Mr. Antov Chernov, the political counselor of Russian Federation, to give his comments. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Chair. Um, I have a supplement to Mr. Shahudil Haq's speech and a question, two questions actually. One is to Dr. Daki Turkey Bukul and to our colleagues from Europe. Uh, starting from Mr. Haq. When he said that everything that happened in Europe has a great vibrations and what happens in other parts of the world go, go missing. I would remind you that yesterday, 1982, Israel launched a military operation, peace to Galilee in Lebanon, due to hostile activities of Palestine Liberation Organization. And now it is a very rhetoric question. Are they, were there any country from Europe and of course, United States who criticized this operation? No. United States supplied political and military support to Israel. Let's go further. Um, Few of us uh, actually noticed that when Mr. Huck said about international order and so far and so on, few of us noticed that the Western countries, as they used to pump uh, wealth from former colonies, they still keep, in, keep this doing. It's not a secret that at the beginning of our special military operation, Western countries illegally frozen several hundred millions reserves, state reserves of Russia, uh, millions, sorry, billions reserves of Russia as a state, and a lot of reserves and accounts of Russian citizenship. It is more or less the same. And uh, I mean, they do not distinguish. And now uh, to a, state, uh, a question to our European uh, experts. Uh, as I could understand, they keep on saying that uh, pumping of weapons to Ukraine will finally bring Russia to the edge of defeat. But don't they think that these uh, weapons have been already distributed in darknet and finally they will be in hands of terrorists and criminal organizations and how Europe will uh, find a way to, to get out of this puzzle. And to Ambassador, uh, Mr. Ambassador, you're so much so emphasized about the integrity of um, Ukraine and the and uh, legal rights and so far and so on. How can you comment on your military operation in Syria without authorization of Damascus going against international law and order? Thank you very much. So uh, you want to respond? Okay. Before yeah, thank we, you. So we uh, <clears throat> thank you very much. I thought this was a, an interaction between the university and uh, the ambassadors. It became an interaction between diplomats, uh, which is fine, obviously. Uh, I, I, if I knew it, I could bring a few of my colleagues to sit here and ask questions to the Russian ambassador. But anyway, uh, I mean, I will not shy away from answering this question, which is important because uh, there, there is a huge difference, obviously. Uh, you know, what we're doing in Syria is very well justified under, inter under international law. Uh, uh, we are doing operations in Syria to protect our uh, sort of uh, 
country from terrorist attacks. Uh, those terrorists are based in the north of Syria, uh, where they uh, infiltrate and attack. These are PKK, YPG, uh, and PYD terrorists. They're all the same. And that's the reason why we are demanding, uh, actually, uh, a closer cooperation from Sweden and Finland, who do not take enough uh, measures in their own countries against these terrorists. PKK has been uh, recognized by the United States and the European Union as a terrorist organization. And we, it's only natural that we demand our allies uh, to, to um, support our efforts to fight against them. And once uh, Turkey has entered into uh, the territory in uh, northern Syria to create uh, a buffer zone where we uh, secured and created a safety zone, uh, then we uh, were able to prevent millions of other Syrians uh, to flee from Idlib under the attack of the Syrian regime. If we didn't create that zone, then today there would be millions of other refugees in Europe, uh, and most probably some of them would be killed in the meantime. So uh, I, I'm sure uh, our Russian colleagues are well aware of the situation there because uh, they are uh, present on the ground in Syria supporting the Syrian regime. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I just, before I hand it over, to our chair of the session for concluding remarks. I would like to thank all the panelists. It was a fantastic uh, discussion. Our students really got uh, enlightened. Our faculty members also, it was a, a kind of a, uh, we always uh, discuss these issues uh, within our, uh, during our tea breaks or in our faculty rooms, but uh, getting an opportunity to learn the issue from ambassadors and also, um, uh, from the panelists from uh, a different part of the world is a, is a very uh, a rare opportunity. And I would like to thank uh, both the ambassadors to come here physically and giving the opportunity for our students, for our faculty members. And um, I do apologize from our side if um, any uh, kind of uh, unpleasant uh, questions been raised or you felt uh, a little bit embarrassed, but I think because of this economy, uh, academic environment, we always encourage our students uh, to talk from their mind. And I'm sure that we'll get opportunity in future also to listen from uh, you again. So uh, with that- uh, Professor Tofi, can I just take one second? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so because sure. because uh, I raised a question: Who wins and who lose? Now, uh, uh, I, I think the especially to my dear students, you should also think: Who is actually winning? Is is the global defense establishment? Three ways: testing new weapon system, selling the new weapon system to all parties across the world, and building and designing new uh, system to kill people. So they are actually the main winner out of this conflict. Thank you very much. Keep your eyes open. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Shoid, for a, importantly uh, raising this issue, which was missing the military industrial complex and all, all that this uh, big uh, this, um, defense industries that uh, who will also be making money out of uh, conflict. So any conflict is also a source of profit for some people. At least few new billionaires will be created that can be assured. So with that, I now hand it over to our Vice Chancellor, uh, Professor Ismail Hussain, to give his uh, concluding remarks. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Professor Tafik. It has been a very long discussion and very interesting discussion. Uh, the topic was uh, importance of diplomacy in conflict resolution. And unbundling the topic, we have seen that there are very complex issues involved and there is no easy answer. There is no straightforward answer probably. And that is why diplomacy is failing. <clears throat> so we have seen in the world that many similar questions have been settled militarily. And we have fought for long, long years. And then finally we have finished this when the other party, one party is being totally defeated. And there are also conflicts, political conflicts where 
uh, region has won and diplomacy had its role. From the discussion, it appears that at the present moment, uh, the conflict has no place for diplomacy to win. Maybe going down the line, diplomacy will come and there will be a diplomatic solution. But as of now, we don't see any chance of diplomacy to play a big role in this conflict. Of course, one of our panelists have mentioned that it is very difficult to predict um, outcomes or events, not only economic events, but also political events. So maybe we might have some surprise that it is politically and diplomatically solved. So with these few words, I thank you very much. Thank you all. And Salaam Alaikum. Thank you very much, sir. And thank you all again. And uh, with that, we are formally concluding. But I uh, just request our guests to be seated. We have token of appreciation.